Praise the Lord, saints. Pastor Daryl Scott here, senior pastor, New Spirit Revival Center Church in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, along with my wife, my, my best half, Dr. Belinda Scott, who serves as uh, the co-pastor of our great church. It's Thursday evening, time for Bible study again. We're going to go into the Word of God, amen, and a series that I've entitled The Life and Teachings of Jesus. You know, we love the Lord. We worship him. We praise him. We magnify him. We lift him up. We glorify him. We exalt. We esteem. We admire. We respect the Lord. But a lot of us really don't know this God that we worship, this, this God come in the flesh, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We can always get to know him better. So I believe that if you have ears to hear and a heart to receive, that you will be blessed this evening. Uh, you'll hear something you've never heard. You'll learn something you never knew, and it will enhance your walk with the Lord. Amen. Uh, it, it, there's a lot to Jesus. The Bible says that if everything that he had done or said had been written, all of the world couldn't contain the, the, the number of books that it would take. But we're going to try our best to go in and get as much as we can Amen, through this study on tonight. And I believe that it will enhance your understanding and um, improve your relationship with him. It will enhance the relationship you have with the Lord as well. So let's go into the sanctuary, get this word. I'll be back after and we'll chop it up a little bit more. God bless you. When you're there, say amen. Let's begin reading. We're going to read the entire chapter, 17 verses. Y'all be all right after that. Let's go. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Let's read together. And saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern gurgle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, the God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Father, bless us tonight. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I recently began a study, I believe it was week before last, on the life and the teaching of Jesus Christ, which I believe can and will enhance one's personal relationship with the Lord and uh, increase the presence of the Lord in one's life. In that, as I stated, presence is governed by relationship with and knowledge of. It's governed by Amen. One's relationship and one's knowledge with another the singular individual. The greater the knowledge one has of God and the greater one is consecrated to God, then the greater God's presence is enjoyed and experienced in one's life. And so in the initial study, our prior study, I uh, 
we observed, we examined how in the fullness of time, uh, in the divine timing of the Lord, because, you know, the Lord is more interested in timing uh, than he is with time or our concepts of time. With God, his divine time, amen, is, uh, coincides with his divine timing. And so it was in the fullness of time when everything in the world and everything in the souls of men was ready and prepared, amen. The word of God was then made flesh and dwelt among us, not a moment too early, amen, not a moment too late, but exactly at the precise time of the Lord's determination, say amen. Now, the thing we realize in examining the life of the Lord is that the first 30 years of the Lord's life on earth are relatively concealed, even though you have in certain apocryphal writings, uh, myths and, 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 and fables about the Lord that are inconsistent with the canon of scripture. But the first 30 years of his life are relatively concealed, amen. However, we are provided glimpses in the gospels and, and even in the Psalms, we are provided glimpses of his early life. Luke chapter two, verse 40 states, it says the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. This gives us once again a glimpse of his early life. Luke goes on in verse 49 of Luke chapter 2 and says, when Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. When he reached the age of 12 and he went to the temple for the first time to engage in the religious festivities, amen. And it was, as it were, in comparison to our modern day bar mitzvahs, he was able for the first time to go into the temple. I wonder what he felt when he was able to go into the temple at the, 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 at that time for the first time in his life, amen. And he was, the Bible says, sitting in the midst of the doctors of the law. The Bible says he was both hearing them and answering questions and astonishing the doctors of the law with his answers and with his understanding. It says they were amazed at his understanding. Luke chapter 2 verse 52 then states that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with man. Isaiah, amen, chapter 7, verses 14 through 16, gives us another glimpse of him prophetically when it speaks of Jesus growing in knowledge, amen. Isaiah chapter 50 speaks of the Lord, amen, uh, uh, having, uh, saying the Lord God has given him the tongue of the learned so that he might speak a word in season to him that is weary. Isaiah chapter 11, 1 to 50 through 12 speaks of the Messiah growing up before God as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. Once again, glimpses, glimpses, not, not an entire uh, description or biography, but glimpses of him in those 30 years of obscurity. Psalm 119 prophesies of the Messiah, amen, verses 97 through 104, meditating in the word of God. He says, I have become wiser than my enemies and I have more understanding than all of my teachers and the ancients, which gives us the insinuation that Jesus did attend school. Amen. He did have teachers who instructed him in the will and the ways of the Lord. He said, I've become wiser. I know more than my teachers know. I even know more and have greater understanding than the ancients. Amen. Referencing. And then he said, I refrain my feet from every evil way. Amen. Meaning that he disciplined himself to walk in the ways of the Lord. That evil ways were indeed presented to him, but he determined in his spirit that he would not walk in them. Psalm 119. 102 says, I have not departed from thy judgments for thou hast taught me meaning that he received instructions by way of the Holy Spirit come on say amen to me he said through thy precepts I get understanding he immersed himself in the study of the word of God he said therefore I hate every false way in order to hate the false way you have to have knowledge of the true way come on talk back to me so then we learn from the glimpses that we get of the Lord in the word of God that Jesus grew to manhood and he developed 
normally like any other child. Amen. He had, he had temptations presented to him. He had opportunities for evil presented to him that he refused, that he eschewed, that he disdained. Amen. As he endeavored to walk in the ways of the word of God as he received it. Amen. His Bible being the Old Testament and the law and the prophets and him reading and studying it diligently so he could master his contents and walk in his way. He was always divine, we understand, when he came to earth. He did not cease to be God in his nature. He retained his possession of deity, but he restrained his expression of deity. Talk back to me, somebody. <clears throat> we know that he was both human and divine. But he lived his life on earth as a human, serving as an example to all of those who desire to live for God, to walk in his will, walk in his ways, and to serve him. He laid aside, the Bible says, his divine attributes made himself of no reputation. He, he, he laid aside his divine attributes, or at the very least, he limited their use, becoming an example of one who was yielded to God and dependent on the Holy Spirit for the walk that they walk in him and to gain victory over the world and victory over the flesh and victory over the devil. Doing his works he did by and through the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Acts 10 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. Come on say amen to me. And with power, he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And he did that in order to demonstrate because everything Jesus did was, was an object lesson for believers, amen. There was a teaching moment. Every, there were no incidental, coincidental occurrences in his life. Everything was a teaching moment. Everything was an object lesson. He demonstrated that every believer can be anointed by the Spirit to live victoriously like he lived and to do works and greater works than he did, his life serving as a pattern for us. Somebody say, well, how can we do greater works? He raised the dead man, then raised two dead men. Come on, say amen to me. He didn't say greater in quality, but it could also insinuate greater in quantity. So after 30 years of private preparation, after 30 years of anonymity, the Bible says in Luke chapter 3, verse 13, then, excuse me, Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, then cometh Jesus. After 30 years, we haven't heard anything from this guy since he was born. I have one little pop, one little snapshot we see when he was 12. Then 18 years later, it says, then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized by him. So then we see that all of the gospel writers agree that Jesus' call was in some way connected with John the Baptist's preaching. Say amen. And his call was also connected with the revival that resulted from John the Baptist's preaching. Can we continue? Matthew 3.13 begins with the word then. I mean, you see all of the reading we did in those days, chapter 3 is basically a, 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 a quick study in John. In those days, John came and repent, kingdom of heaven. He begins to quote the prophet Isaiah saying, prepare the way of the Lord. It's telling about what the clothes he had on. He had a uh, raiment of camel's hair and, and, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And it says, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea. Amen. All being a figure of speech known of as a synecdoche where uh, a, a whole is mentioned for a part. All Judea. They were baptized him. They confessed their sins. Then he sees the Pharisees and Sadducees. The men of God came out to John's meeting. Now get this in your mind. Here this guy is, he starts his ministry, bust out of nowhere at John the Baptist, right? Commanding everybody to repent. Prepare you the way of the Lord. The Messiah is coming, get ready. Confess your sins and repent. Word of this gets back to uh, the denominational headquarters. So they're going to see. Tie this young boy out here. Think about it. John's six months older than Jesus. John prepared 30 years for a six-month ministry. As soon as Jesus came out, he said, I must decrease now. Think about it. He had a six-month jump on Jesus. 
you prepare all that time for a ministry to last about six months. And they come to see, and when they come to see, he's preaching, and he stops. Who warned y'all to come out here? You snakes, you vipers. You know, I get people like, you know, I, I'm still working on, you know, my sanctification. And I get some kind of sick pleasure out of clapping back. <laughs> hey, man, I be, hey, and I be telling you, I be, I be having fun with it. And, and so, you know, now then, then the, the accusations come. How is that like Jesus? You ain't, you're not, fine. and I say, yes, I am. No, no, you ain't. I said, well, Matthew chapter 23, Jesus called his critics snakes, vipers, uh, blind guides, fools, whited sepulchers, and told them they was all going to hell. So don't tell me I don't sound like Jesus. I'm sounding just like Jesus. He called them fools. He called them blind guys, whited sepulchers, snakes, generation of vipers, and said, all of y'all are going to hell. But they come to hear John. They come to see what's going on. John calls them uh, 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 generation of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He told them, bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. And don't tell yourself that because I'm a child of Abraham and heir to the covenant that I've got some privileges with God. He said, no, nah, y'all y'all, y'all going to get it. After it does that, it says, then. John gets through doing all that. Then cometh Jesus. And once again, with that 13th verse, beginning with the word then, it connects us with the preceding verses of all that John had done. Amen. And it signifies the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, which would conclude at Calvary. Amen. Which was the purpose of his coming. The word then signifies all that the prophets of the Old Testament had spoken of. Amen. Then, then, the word, everybody say then. The word then signifies the greatest moment in human history up to that day. Amen. Then Jesus came. Then cometh Jesus out of anonymity. John's voice had cried out in the wilderness for the way of the Lord to be prepared. And then came Jesus. Help me, Holy Ghost. He came at the set time. At the time set and predetermined by the Holy Ghost, he came from privacy into publicity. Amen. He became to begin his work. He came with purposeful intent. He put down his carpenter tools. He closed his carpenter shop. He left his mother's house because now had become then. And how many of you know that there comes a time in your life when your now becomes then? Jesus' time was now, so then he came. And when your now and your then coincide, it's when your now and your then intersect that you come to a crossroads in your life where you decide to obey God once and for all. Shout about it. Jesus' time was now, so then he came. Look at somebody and say, he came with a purpose. Then he came with intent. Then the Bible says he came. What? For what? He came to be baptized. So wait a minute then. His coming then was of set purpose and special reason. He didn't just meander up and see what was going on and just uh, randomly happen to just roll up in there at that time. He came with a set purpose. He came to be baptized by John. But notice now, it says John initially forbade him. John said, I should be getting baptized by you. How are you going to baptize me? You're coming to me. I should be baptized by you. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. So then why did Jesus come to partake of it? Because he had nothing to repent of. He had no sin to put away. 
Now notice now, watch this. In Matthew chapter 3, the 15th verse, Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Notice what he said. Suffer or allow. Allow it to be so now. Notice this. Now watch. One little word has a great deal of significance. He says, for thus it becomes us. He didn't say, thus it becomes me. He didn't say, thus it becomes you. He said, thus it becomes us. It becomes John and him Self working together in concert to fulfill all righteousness. He was saying, John, you acting with me and me acting with you in and for the fulfillment of righteousness. So watch this. What does this mean then? It tells us that the primary element in the baptism of Jesus was the identification of the sinless with the sinful. The sinless one with the sinner. He who had no sin to repent of took his place among those who had sin to repent of. So he submitted to the baptism of John, indicating by this symbolic action his identification with his people in their sin. You know, the doctrine of identification is a core doctrine in Christianity. It means that Jesus identified with us in our sinfulness so that we could identify him in his sinlessness. It means that when he died, we died. When he was buried, our old man was buried. When he got up, we got up in the newness of life. He was connecting with us symbolically. In that he that be, knew no sin became sin for us. He didn't become literal sin. Sin is not some tangible substance that you can wash away with some water. Come on, say amen to me. He became sin, that word sin in the literal Greek, ra, sin offering. He became an offering for our sins. Come on, say amen to me. So his identification with his people in our sins was so that he might put the sin away and build and establish the kingdom of God in order to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus goes down into the Jordan River to take his stand by the side of sinners. He came to identify with us, not to be different and distant and disconnected from us. And it was a prophetic symbol of the life that he lived, saints of God, and the walk that he walked. His detractors had accused him throughout the word of God of being a friend of publicans and sinners. Yes, man. They called him a drunk. He's a friend of publicans and sinners. And that was because he didn't look down on people that walked in darkness. Instead, he brought them into his life. And you know what? That's how sometimes you find it easier fellowshipping with unsaved folk than you do with saved folk. Because the unsaved folk ain't judging you. The unsaved folk looking up to you. Them people on your job respect you more than the people in your church. Sometimes. Talk back to me. You don't have to worry about them quoting scripture in your face and stabbing you in the back at the same time. You don't have to worry about them gossiping about you in the name of the Lord. Say amen. His detractors, he's a friend of the publicans. He's a friend of sinners. He didn't look down on the folk. He brought them into his life. Jesus going into that water, saints of God, demonstrated the fact that there's nowhere he won't go to set his people free from the works of the enemy. Let me tell you something about Jesus. Jesus go, goes where the need calls. When need connects with faith, when the now of faith connects with the needs of then, how many of you know Jesus will show up regardless of somebody's reputation? He'll sit at the tables of the outcasts. He'll fellowship with the misfits. He'll socialize with the rejects. Come on, say amen to me. And he even made his, he died between two thieves. The Bible says that he was numbered with the transgressors at death. But you have to understand, he numbered himself with us first in life. 
He took his stand by the side of sinners. He didn't go down to the rabbinical school and try to kick it with the scribes and Pharisees and the religious ones that felt that they had everything together. He went to the ones who knew they were messed up. He went to the ones who knew they were bound for hell. Come on, talk back to me. He took his stand by the side of sinners at the Jordan River, making our shame his shame, making our troubles his troubles, making our problems his problems, making our issues his issues, making our burdens his burdens. Somebody shout glory. He numbered himself with us then so that we can be numbered with him now. Talk about it. Now, let's examine what immediately followed the baptism in water. In verse 16, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight way out of the water. He went out of the water because he was in the water. He didn't get sprinkled. Say amen. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. A lower voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This epoch right here marks the end of Jesus' private life and the beginning of his public life. And it states that when he came up out of that water, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the spirit of the Lord des descending in a visible form like a dove, but not descending. He wasn't, in other words, the Holy Ghost didn't come down looking like a bird. But he saw a visible form of the Holy Spirit descending or lighting upon him. And then a voice said from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Clear evidence of the Trinity there. The Father speaking from heaven, the Spirit descending like a dove, uh, the Son in the water. I remember talking, arguing with the, with the, with the Jesus-only boys, and, and they trying to act like Jesus threw his voice up there. <laughs> no, y'all laughing, it's true. Like he do some like divine ventriloquism, <laughs> threw his voice up there and made it come back. And, 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 and then I reminded him one time, it's a scripture in John where he says, Father, glorify thy name. And the voice came from heaven and said, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. And so I'm using that as an example when I'm arguing with the Jesus only boys. And they're like, well, have you ever talked to yourself? I said, yeah, but I don't answer. <laughs> it's a difference between talking to yourself like, man, what I got to do? I got to go to the store today, and after that, I got to do this. But I ain't sitting back. What I got to do? I don't know. What do you have to do? I think I'm going to go to the store. Well, what store should we go to? Well, I don't know. I don't hold conversations with talking to myself and holding a conversation with myself are two different dynamics. <laughs> Say amen. amen. This is my beloved son. And once again, this coincides with the anointing that we read about in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, when it talks about how God anointed him with the Holy Ghost and with power. Now the question becomes, what was the meaning of that anointing in the life of Jesus? You have to understand, saints, that Jesus was not now for the first time receiving the Holy Spirit because there was a permanent relationship, a permanent relation that existed between Jesus and the Spirit of God. Jesus was born. He was conceived of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost impregnated Mary with Jesus without sexual uh, intercourse, but the, he was implanted. That thing, that he was conceived of and by the Holy Ghost, amen. His development had been under the control of the Spirit of God. The entire life of Jesus from, from conception through death was dominated by the Spirit of God. He lived and he walked and he thought and under the Spirit's power and the Spirit's impulse and illumination. But what this was, saints of God, was a special anointing upon Jesus for his entrance into public ministry. You have to understand, at salvation, everyone receives the Holy Spirit in a measure. In a measure. He had the Spirit without measure. 
but we receive it in a measure, amen, whereby we receive the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out a father. We are adopted into the family of God. We receive the indwelling presence of the Holy Ghost at salvation. But the baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, that's an entirely different dynamic. It's a special anointing for service. There are two anointings necessary in the life of the believer. I've taught on this before. A little sidebar. Sidebar, the word for anointing we taught before is the word creo, C-H-R-I-O, which means to smear or to rub in. That's the word used for the word anointing. There are two derivatives of that anointing based upon the prefixes that are utilized in their application. Those are the prefixes epi, E-P-I, and N, E-N. Amen. The N creo, the E-N creo is the anointing within. The epi creo is the anointing upon. The increo is for personal use. The epicreo is for professional use. The increo is for you. The epicreo is for others. The increo is for your private life. The epicreo is for your public life. The increo is the anointing within, consecrating and sanctifying and enabling you to live a holy life that is acceptable unto God, choosing the good and refusing the evil and walking in integrity and walking in honesty and walking in celibacy and walking in sobriety. It's the anointing that you rely on to live this Christian life and to walk this Christian walk that you walk. But the epicreo is the anointing upon you that empowers you and enables you to preach and to prophesy, to cast out devils, to lay hand on the sick, and they recover to work works for God, to do whatever it is that God has called and commissioned you to do. Because let me tell you something, and this is where a lot of people mess up. You not only need an anointing for doing you also need an anointing for being. Help me, Holy Ghost. And baby, to be honest, that anointing for being is more important than that anointing for doing. Everybody wants the anointing to do when you need to ask God for the anointing to be. You not only need an anointing to give out to others, you need an anointing to live out yourself. You don't want to be a public success and a private failure where you can prophesy or you can preach or you can pray heaven down or you can sing with the angels but you cannot crucify your flesh with the affections and lust thereof talk back to me somebody that's what's so wrong so, so much these days in the body of Christ people want the anointing to do but they don't care about that anointing to be say amen so then the voice of the father is heard from heaven. Jesus nourished and developed that anointing to be before he stepped out in his anointing to do. And it took him 30 years. Say amen. Now these folks want to get saved 15 minutes ago. And I'm an evangelist. You better sit your butt down. You better, you better fall first <laughs> and get back up again. Say amen. You better learn wisdom. Say amen. amen. That's why you see so much garbage in the body of Christ because they don't have the anointing to be. They just want the anointing to do. Say amen. amen. The voice of the Father is heard from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now if you read it in Mark's gospel and read it in Luke's gospel, it says thou art my beloved son. And there's no discrepancy there because if you read in St. John chapter 1, it insinuates and it suggests that there were actually two utterances. Say amen. One addressed to Jesus as the spirit was descending, you are my beloved son. And then another addressed to John after the descent of the spirit saying, this is my beloved son. Because if you read over in John and see, this is where people get it twisted. You read over in John, John said, I didn't know who he was until God had to show me. He said it. That's why, you know, people like, well, well, John and Jesus was cousins. Well, actually, they weren't cousins, blood. They were countrymen. They were cousins. And the Greeks literally countrymen. They were, they were neighbors. But John actually grew up about 80 miles away from Jesus. I mean, their mamas knew each other. And they was, you know, they was cousins like you and your friend is cousins. 
That's my cousin. Because you've been knowing him since the second grade. That's my cousin. But John was from the tribe of Levi. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. Say amen. But John said, I didn't know who he was. The, the Lord told me he would show him to me. And when he came, and the Lord insinuated to him when he got there, this is the one. Amen. And so then God affirms. He then declares after the affirmation of sonship. And once again, his sonship not being in the biological sense, but in the sense of nature and the sense of being. It was in the ontological sense, not the biological sense. Because the designation of son, you have to understand, and this is where a lot of people confuse it because they keep looking at things in the natural. The designation of son also means to possess the character or the nature or to be in the order of. Notice what it's called. James and John were called what? The sons of thunder. Now, it didn't mean that thunder was their daddy and lightning was their mama. Always oh, something I thought was funny when Ingemar Johansson knocked out Floyd Patterson uh, to win the heavyweight championship for him from him, right? And Inge, Ingemar Johansson was a Swede. And they said, they said, well, how'd you knock out Floyd Patterson? And he said, it's the thunder and the lightning. <laughs> he held up one fist and another fist. It's the, ton it's the thunder and the lightning. <laughs> But they were called the sons of thunder because that was descriptive of their temperament and their character and their nature. We also heard about the sons of the prophets. Why? Because they were of the order. They were of the prophetic order. What does it say about uh, Hotney and Phineas? Sons of Belial. They weren't literally the sons of Satan even though I do know a couple of his kids. I know some of his daughters and some of his sons. Say amen. But it simply means they had the character and nature of the devil. The son of God literally meant one with the same character and same nature and of the same order as God. He said, this is my beloved son, God declares, in whom I am well pleased. Now, another translation, or it can also be translated in the little Greek, this is my beloved son in whom is all of my delight. Say amen. And this declaration by God that this is my beloved son, this is, he came up out of that water, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, that declaration shines the light. It illuminates to us the 30 years of anonymity in Nazareth that Jesus lived. Because as I said, we have no chronicle of those years. We only have intermittent glimpses and intermittent suggestions. And so he is now here 30 years old. He's standing at the Jordan River. He's ready to be baptized. He's ready to serve the purpose of God. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And what it does, it takes your mind back to the Old Testament. When the priest had to examine the sacrifice, and it had to be a lamb without blemish. It had to be a lamb without any imperfection. And what Jesus was saying here, what the Father was saying here, is that Jesus is without blemish. He's without imperfection. That I am well pleased with the life that he has lived up to now. I'm well pleased with his life. He's had 30 flawless years, and he is now ready to be offered. Help me, Holy Ghost. For he said, I am well pleased with the life that he has lived for the prior 30 years, that the life that he lived then prepared him to be used by God now. Tell about that person next to you and tell them, say, the life that you lived then prepares you to be used by God now. You would not be as effective now if you had not done what you did then. Y'all better help me. I don't have much voice. If you had not been what you've been through then, if you had not battled what you battled back then, if you had not conquered what you conquered then, if you had not defeated what you defeated then, 
Look at somebody and say, I learned how obedience. I learned how to obey God through the things I suffered. I learned how to pray. I learned how to believe God. I learned how to hold out. I learned how to hold on by and through the circumstances and the situations that I encountered and I experienced then. And they prepared you to be blessed by and used by God now. Somebody shout glory. He pleased God so much so in his private life that God could use him in his public life. Once again, too many today want to be used in public without being pleasing to God in private. Shout about it. So in his baptism, Jesus assumes the responsibility for sinning man. By the anointing of the Spirit, he was empowered by God. And by the divine voice, he was validated and authorized to act on behalf of God. So then in his baptism, two things came to Jesus. He received a vision and he heard a voice. Help me, Holy Ghost. The voice spoke to him out of heaven. Mm. And in the vision, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit descended. <laughs> so watch this. The voice spake of the then. The vision was for the now. The voice was the call to his life work that he had waited for 30 years to walk in. The vision was for obeying the call and carrying out the work. I'll make it plainer. The voice was for affirmation. The vision was for authorization. The voice affirmed his being while the vision authorized his doing. The voice spoke of who he had been. The vision spoke of who he was now. How many of you know that if you hear God's voice, he will give you vision? His voice will affirm you in your being. His vision will authorize and empower you in your doing so that the combination of the two will result in the purpose of God being fulfilled in your life. Moses heard a voice and he saw a vision. Isaiah heard a voice and he saw a vision. Jeremiah heard a voice and he saw a vision. Is there anybody here tonight that heard God's voice? You heard God call you and the hearing of his voice gave you a vision so much so that you see yourself being and see yourself doing more than you've ever been and more than you've ever done in your life. So that no matter what you did in your past or what's been done to you, it will not stop the call of God that is on your life. Somebody shout hallelujah. I'm just about done. I told myself we're going to be out the door by 9 o'clock. The Spirit of God. That same Spirit of God that the Bible says in Genesis 1 2 moved across, brooded over. The fluttered, hovered over the face of the waters. The same spirit of God that the psalmist said he couldn't get away from. He said, where can I run from you? Where can I hide? If I come up into heaven, you're up there. If I even go down to sleep in hell, you're down there too. The same spirit of God that Isaiah prophetically said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointing me to preach and to proclaim and to bind. That same spirit of God was now focused and concentrated in and upon Jesus' person as he submitted himself to John's baptism and he came up from that water. Help me, Holy Ghost. Both called by God and he came up as the power of God unto salvation. Somebody shout glory. Come on, stand up on your feet, clap your hands, open up your mouth and begin to give God praise. said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm well pleased. That was the divine formula of anointing Jesus. He was anointed for the office of prophet, priest, and king. And that was the prerequisite announcement of and for his messianic mission upon this planet Earth. 
And what it meant was that the father takes great delight and pleasure and satisfaction in the Lord Jesus. And even then when he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, the verb that was employed in that Greek conveys the idea that God's pleasure of the son is constant and continual. That his always has been and always will be pleasing or pleased by the life of Jesus. Come on, clap your hands one more time. And that's all we want God to do is say he's well pleased in the work that we're doing for him. Lift your hands. Father, in the outstanding, tremendous, magnificent name of Jesus, whose we are and whom we serve, once again, we thank you for allowing us into your presence to partake of your word. We thank you for the illumination and the enlightenment and the inspiration that accompanies our reception of your word. Now I pray, O oh Lord, that the seed of your word that was sown into the soil of our spirit fall upon good ground germinate and bring forth a tremendous harvest in our lives so that our being and our doing, amen, might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord. I pray, Father, that you continue to use and to mold and to shape and to develop and to form and to fashion your people into the image that you desire them to walk in, that they, that they be pleasing to you individually and collectively, and that you might use them in unique ways to accomplish the doing and the performance of your will in and for their life. I pray that you bless them also, O oh Lord, spiritually, materially, financially, amen, uh, physically, bless them, O oh Lord, exceeding and abundantly above all that they may ask or think according to your power at work in their life. Honor their faith and their faithfulness. Honor their commitment and dedication to you. Continue to lead and guide them into green pastures by still waters, O oh Lord. Prosper them. Open up heaven's windows and pour blessings out upon them. Make their way prosperous. Give them good success. Amen. Answer their questions, O oh Lord. Answer their prayers. Solve their problems, O oh Lord. Give them joy and give them peace and give them happiness, O oh Lord. And stabilize their home and families, O oh Lord. Give them the desires of their heart. Let them live abundant lives, O oh Lord. Let them enjoy the fruit of this earth, O oh Lord. Let them come behind in no good thing. And we give you a glory, honor, and praise for everything we expect and anticipate you doing in our life. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. Okay, saints, as the Apostle Paul said, so much is in me is. Now remember, you've got to hear his voice in order to receive a vision from the Lord. You have to hear his voice. The hearing of his voice will produce a vision in your life. The, 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 the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we hear his voice through his word and the hearing of his voice, the hearing of his word uh, will produce a vision in our life. How shall we hear, the Bible says, without a preacher? <laughs> so the hearing of the word of God will result in the production, the formation of a vision in your life, which will enable you to fulfill the call of God that is on your life. Now, remember what we said. We said the, vi the voice was for affirmation. The vision was for authorization. The voice affirms your being. The vision empowers your doing. And so, you know, uh, the, the affirmation comes through hearing the voice. What's the affirmation? Uh, affirmation that comes through his, from, from his voice. It's, it's what comes, we receive it now through his word. The affirmations of God, you're more than a conqueror. The affirmations of God, uh, you can do all things through Christ. The affirmations of God, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. The affirmations of God, he'll always cause you to triumph. Those are the affirmations of God. The hearing of his word will affirm you as to who you are in him. And then it, the vision that God gives you will enable you to walk in the anointing that you receive. What is the purpose of the anointing? The purpose of the anointing is not for you to be grand or uh, for any self-aggrandizement or to win popularity contests. The purpose of the anointing is to enable you to do what God has called you to do. Amen? So you hear his, his voice, you receive a vision, you walk in the purpose that God has for you. Amen. Even as Jesus did. The Bible says that we should be like him. Amen. 
Uh, we want to be as much like him. The servant should not be above his master, but the servant should try to be as his master is. So we want to be more and more like Jesus. We want to hear his word on a regular basis. Allow that word to produce a vision in our life, which will enable and empower us, amen, to fulfill the purpose he has for us. All right? All right. Now, listen, we're going to bless the Lord even now in a different way, and that's through the giving of our material gifts. You know, my wife and I were uh, talking about some things earlier today, and we brought up the fact that the enemy will erode the fiber and the foundation of the church, not through anything drastic, but through indifference. The first sign of backsliding is indifference. I stop caring. I stop uh, having the uh, service to God as my priority in life. I can get to the point where I can take it or leave it. I'm there or I'm not there. I do it or I won't do it. Uh, you know, indifference. Indifference is one of the enemy's greatest tools that he uses against the church. And the one way that the indifference initially shows up is one's lack of participation. And you can be in church on a regular basis and still not be a participant. And that lack of participation shows up the earliest at offering time. The people will begin to uh, withhold from God. Or like God said, you've, you've, you've robbed me, you've defrauded me. How? In your tithe and offerings. You know, that's something that you see the most amount of disagreement in the church is at the time of the offering. You can have a service or even as we are having service online tonight and everyone can be in agreement with the word that goes forth. But then when the offering time comes forth, everyone is not in agreement. That's where the church really needs to get on one accord in regards to the offering. We want to bless the Lord right now. We want to give the Lord our best gift. We hear his voice. Amen. When his voice tells us to bring the tithe and offering into the storehouse that there may be spiritual meat in his house for his people. It, when, the, when, the, when his voice says through his word, because all a voice is, is the sound of words. The sound of words. His word says the tithe is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. His word says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Press down, shaking together and running over. His word says, honor the Lord with your substance and the first fruit of all your increase. His word says, God ministers seed to who? The sower and multiplies the seed sown. His word says that when we pay our tithe here, he receives them in the, in there where he is, of whom it is witnessed that Jesus Christ lives. So his word, his voice tells us to tithe. And when we allow that voice to minister to us, when we allow that voice to, amen, to be received, it will produce a vision in us, amen, that will empower and motivate us to, amen, do what the voice is telling us to do. You know what I'm saying? The Bible, you know, there's an anointing to give. The Bible talks about it in the book of 2 Corinthians. Paul listed the gifts that the Corinthian church not only possessed, but were expressing in church. They were practicing, they were they, they were utilizing the gifts. And Paul said, you're doing good. You're using and utilizing the gifts that God has made available for you. But then he went on to say, you, you, you're flowing in all those other gifts. See that, that you flow in this gift also. And then he went on to expound upon giving. He called giving a gift. To be able to give is a gift, not only a gift to God, but a gift from God. And that's a gift a lot of believers amen, don't desire to walk in. You know, I want to, I want the gift of healing and I want the gift of miracles and I want the gift of uh, 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 whatever, but they don't want the gift of giving. And that gift is very, very necessary. Paul calls it a gift, a grace from God to give. Amen. Grace is the activity of God upon your heart. Amen. That's what it is. And giving is a gift. Giving is a grace from God. But he didn't give you. He's not going to give you that gift if you're not going to use it. So let's utilize that gift. Let's all flow in that gift on tonight. That's a gift every believer can flow in anytime they want to. The gift of giving. We want to be flowing the gifts. Let's flow in that gift. Paul says you want to flow in all the gifts. Flow in the gift of giving. So I want to encourage you to flow in the gift of giving on tonight. Go to givelify.com, 
G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y, or text to give, PayPal, Tidely, whatever platform you utilize to flow in that gift of giving uh, towards New Spirit Revival Center. I want you to go there right now. We're sowing a grace seed, $53, uh, five being the number of grace, three being the number of God. There's a lot of symbolism in uh, biblical numerics. We want to flow in that. We want the grace of God, the gifts of God, gift, grace, grace, gift, same thing, to flow and abound and superabound in our life. If you genuinely can't give that $53, sow a $35 seed. Three, once again, the number of God. Five, the number of grace. But we're going to tap in. This seed symbolizes the condition of my heart because the Bible says where your treasure is, that's where your heart, where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. My, my, my treasure, my sowing is indicative of the condition of my heart. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave all of his only. We so love God that we don't have a problem giving to him as well. In fact, it's a joy to give to the work of God. It's a joy to be able to pay your tithe. It's a joy to support your church financially. It's a joy. It's a responsibility. It's a gift for you to be able to do that. And it's going to gain you uh, merit in heaven. God will say, you know what? Well done, thou faithful, uh, good and faithful servant. You supported my kingdom on earth. Amen. That gains you favor and merit in heaven. God told David, because you have decided to build me a house. David took of his own personal money and contributed towards the building of the house of God. He said, I'm going to establish your house. It's a biblical principle right there. You build the house of the Lord, the Lord will establish your house. Your house is your household, your your. Uh, posterity. Your house is your uh, your being, your doing. Amen. The Bible says the house of David waxed strong while the house of Saul waxed weak. Why? Because David had a heart towards the things of God and Saul didn't. And God will strengthen and fortify your house, everything that concerns you, as a response to your giving. God is a reciprocal God. He said, I in you, you in me. Amen. Uh, he said, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, that's a reciprocity right there. You'll ask what you will and it shall be done. Give and it shall be given unto you. Reciprocity, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. David said, I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. Let me tell you something. You can never outgive God and you can never go wrong by giving to God. And I will be honest and say this. I've never regretted any offering I ever gave to the Lord. I don't care what service. I don't care who was preaching. I don't care where I was at, what church it was at. Every offering I gave, I knew I'm giving this to God. And I've never regretted it. And he's never forsaken me, nor have I ever had to beg bread. Right? Because I believe God and I don't have a problem sowing into them. You know what? A lot of us, that's the final frontier. A lot of us just can't get past that money. When you get the victory over money, you can get the victory over a lot of things. And so, you know, you should have no problem. The Bible says the liberal soul, the generous soul shall be made fat, shall be enriched, shall prosper. He that waters shall himself be watered. Cast your bread upon the water. Cast that seed upon the water. The water is symbolic of the moving of the Holy Ghost. You sow your seed where the Holy Ghost is moving, and believe me, there's going to be a harvest that comes your way. All right? All right. We'll be in church this Sunday. Once again, 3130 Mayfield Road, Cleveland Heights, Ohio, 1015 a.m. New Spirit Revival Center will be live in the sanctuary. If you absolutely, positively, unequivocally cannot be there on this Sunday, you log on right here in this same place and we'll be here at 11 o'clock sharp. All right? All right. Listen, once again, I pray that word blessed you. I pray you learned more about the life and the teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that, you know, the, the word of God is going to release a vision of you in you to be all that you can be for God, to do all that you can do for God. And it's going to start in you being and doing all that you can be and do for God in church, in church. You seek to excel to the edifying of the church. Once you prove yourself in church, 
God will prove you outside of church. There are a lot of people that have ministry in you. You use that ministry in church. God is going to prove it in church before he moves you outside of the church. Use your gifts, your talents, your anointing to make your church better, to improve your church. Amen. For the service of the Lord. All right? All right. Sow that seed, $53 seed, $35 seed. Sow it to the kingdom. Give it a five.com. I see you guys on this Sunday, one way or another. I'm going to see you live, or I'm going to be kicking it with you right here online at 11 a.m. All right? All right. The blessing of the Lord be upon you. I pray that he move exceeding and abundantly uh, above all that you can ask or think according to his power working in your life. I bless you in the name of the Lord.